Welcome to Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston, Ph.D. Dr. Glenn is a clinical psychologist and former multi-million dollar consultant to the big food industry and uses his experience to help you defeat your cravings. This show will help you to focus on dramatically reducing cravings and leaving the diet mentality behind so you can more easily and effortlessly achieve your health, fitness, and body composition goals. Please remember, no doctor-patient relationship is created via this show, and you are responsible for confirming any changes to your diet, health, or psychological routines with an appropriately licensed professional before implementing them. Before we get started, if you haven't downloaded the free smartphone app to access dozens of these recordings all in one place, as well as to avail yourself of a confidential community for support, motivation, and assistance, please visit the podcast link on DefeatYourCravings.com as soon as possible. And now, here's your host, Dr. Glenn Livingston. Hey, this is the very good Dr. Glenn Livingston with DefeatYourCravings.com. And I've got a special treat for you. I've got one of our most stellar success stories. Matt Soskins here to talk to you about his path and his background and some of the key insights that he had. I'll let him tell you exactly what he's done. So you can benefit from his experience and strength and wisdom and hope and enthusiasm, as well as his trials and tribulations and stumbles and falls. Right, Matt? That's right. And great to talk to you, Glenn. Great to be here too. Give me a little bit of a background, please, about what your struggles with eating have been and what you tried, things that worked, things that didn't work, and then how did these methods help you? Yeah, so my struggles, it's really almost literally been lifelong. Basically, I learned that my genetics don't match well with our current environment. Since I was very young, everyone in my family was overweight. They were physically unhealthy, and they had an unhealthy relationship with food. When I was very young, I was an exception to that, but then seemingly overnight, I went from a size four slim to a size six husky, and I was scared. I didn't want to end up like the rest of my family. And so from a very early age, I started a cycle of being overly restrictive and then binging. I've asked my mom recently, and she says, I was six when I stopped eating for a week. That's when the war began, when I started fighting. I remember junior high when I worked at Subway and my standard dinner was three foot long subs, three bags of chips and some cookies. I remember in high school when I first started trying to outrun my fork, I was on the cross country team, the track team and the soccer team. And I would eat candy before my workouts and chili fries after. I lost weight a few times and I always put it back on plus interest. And I remember when I thought the dryer shrunk my size 33 jeans because I couldn't be gaining weight, went off to college, gained the freshman 15 plus a little extra. And after my first year in the summer, I lost the weight and I kept it off using a very extreme diet, extreme exercise regimen. I was on um, the fencing team, the lacrosse team. I always did at least two martial arts at a time. And I lifted weights literally every day, including sneaking into the gym on Christmas. So I was kind of healthy looking on the outside, but not on the inside. When I was 19, the fencing coach referred me to student health and I was diagnosed with an eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, non-purging subtype. People usually call it exercise bulimia. Yes. Yes. That's what I had too. Yeah. The joke about it I tell is that every day for me was either Thanksgiving or New Year's Day, where I was either binging or I was in the gym with my New Year's resolution. So my weight bounced around between 140 and 225, and I'm five foot six. I remember when I had to buy size 40 pants. I remember 38s. I remember 36s. I remember going up and then to some extent going back down. I lied to myself and to others about it for decades. I didn't want to think I was defective. I didn't want to think there was something wrong with me. Through trial and error, sheer willpower, I figured out how to look physically okay by just dramatically reducing my calories most days. And then I would binge once or twice a week. Binges were extreme, almost like I was competing to see how much garbage can I stuff into my mouth. So I wouldn't drink water so I could eat more. And then regardless of what I thought, regardless of what I told myself, I would always fail while traveling. That would spill over 
sometimes to the day before a trip. Well, you're going to screw up tomorrow. Let's just get on with it. Or after the plane lands, well, since we're going to get back on the horse tomorrow, let's stop by this Mexican place, both the shop that's near the airport and then also the one that's close to home on the way home and pick up the same thing. I was afraid of travel, afraid of social events, to some extent afraid of being alone because then I knew I might screw up. One morning after a a binge-filled work trip to Sacramento, which included on the way home from Burbank Airport, hitting both the Sharkies next to the airport and then the one in Pasadena, was searching the web for how to stop binging. And I found a lot of the usual nonsense. And uh, then I found your book. And I listened to a podcast interview you did. I don't remember who it was with. It was maybe 45 minutes. And it just instantly made sense to me. Why? What was it that instantly made sense? So it was the idea that you do have control. There are things you can do. Your habits, your wiring, you can fix those. There's the inner food monster, the the separation, and that this is how. And that if you just keep getting it right, you'll get there. And you don't need to... Sorry, you said one thing, and I'm thinking of everything just jumps out at me because I'm so excited. But you don't need to try to solve your childhood, your mommy, daddy issues to stop binging. You can stop binging now, even if you know the cause. And by the way, I do. Let's get it right now. And then if you want to solve those things, having binging out of the way will make it a whole lot easier to go back and solve those things, which it has for me. I always say that if you really want to know why you overeat, then stop overeating and you'll find out why. Don't put the cart before the horse. Yeah. That is perfect. I downloaded the book. I read it on my phone in a few hours. I was just intent, nonstop reading. And I immediately, like that day, started improving. Still failing here and there, still fighting my way through, actually still failing a lot, just a whole lot less often, night and day. And I was clearly on the right path. Failures were less frequent. They were shorter. They were less extreme. It was wonderful. I do annual goals for my birthday, which is late February. So my goal, which would have occurred from March 1st, 2020 to February 26th, 2021, was to honestly, openly say I had an eating disorder. You mean had past tense? Had past tense. Yeah, in all caps. And with COVID, things happened. I worked for a hospital system. I was stressed and I wasn't ready and I didn't succeed. And I'm not really interested in excuses. The the fact is uh, I didn't do what I needed to do then, which is totally okay. But I learned from then and kept going forward, kept doing better, kept improving. And I ended up doing the intensive program because I had moved, there were some other stressors, and I said, well, one more time, and we're going to do this. I don't know why I was putting it off. Maybe my pig was afraid of it, but I'm so glad I did it. It just went into so much more depth and, and so much work with the ideas, with the coaching. I knew I would improve, but I, I did not imagine my current level of success was possible. I didn't imagine that I could learn as much as I did about myself, about the problem, and then how to fix it. So one of the things I learned is, of course, I'm not defective with respect to food. You know, my genetics mismatch with our current environment, like kind of everybody else. I did have my resting metabolic rate tested, and it's about 40% lower than average. But more importantly, I'd spent decades developing and strengthening really bad habits related to food. And I can't change my genetics. I can't change my childhood. But Your program taught me how to stop listening to the inner food monster and start changing my habits, changing my behavior. And so as I continued making the right choices, it just got easier and easier. And for a while I was fighting and worried and, oh, is this going to work? But I was still winning, but I had to fight through some of the wins. And then a couple of weeks go by and you're, I'm only fighting once a week, still winning every time, but still fighting here and there. And eventually my default setting just has been gradually changing. And so I'm now healthy mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. I have no fear that I'm going back. I'm not afraid of food situations or food. 
I know, and this is something I posted, it won't work in audio, but it doesn't matter because I love it. My size 40 jeans, G-E-N-E-S, will always fit in my size 29 jeans, J-E-A-N-S. That's great. What stopped you from giving up? You've been through a lot of other programs and thoughts and you kept bouncing up and down. Why was this the one that you stayed with? Partly because I saw the progress, partly because of the support and the accountability. I think the coaching, it's interesting because sometimes the coaching was so good that I didn't notice how good it was. And I remember talking about this. It seemed like I'm the one doing all the work and he's doing very little. I joked about how that made it obvious that he was really good at what he was doing to make it seem like he didn't have to do much work because he he clearly was, and he was clearly adapting things personally for me. I like that I got to set the rules for me and that we focused on how are we going to get me to the next step? Not what's going to work for most people or what works for others or some book or something, but we need to get me to the next step. How are we going to do that? And I just found that that made it easy. It made it bite-sized for me. I wasn't trying to go from where I was instantly to where I am today. That, that isn't possible. But we were able to set very clear goals, very clear boundaries of, hey, this is what we need to do to get to the next step. And this is how we're going to measure it. And it was doable and it happened. It sounds like your coach really respected your autonomy and he was consistently present and thinking very carefully about what might work, but he stayed out of your way. Yeah. And there were some times when he pushed back, which I thought were great. There was a time when I really, really needed him. Death in the family that was unexpected. And then two weeks later, I had had an event circled on my calendar. I've been to something like 40 professional work conferences where you spend a few nights there and there's just unlimited, horrible food-like substances around everywhere. You're sleeping in a hotel, you're tired, everyone else is eating the garbage, you feel the pressure. So I'd been to about 40 of those and I had always failed miserably, no matter what I had tried and I or I had succeeded for a couple of days and then failed. And then the next morning I said, well, I'm not gonna eat today to make up for it, which is a horrible idea and then failed more. I had had that circled for a long time, and it was a week in Chicago, which is a long time, and in the city I lived when I first cracked 200 pounds and then eventually 225. He was there with me. We had Zooms, we had emails, we had discussions, but we prepared for it. We took it seriously. He let me be the driver, but he was really giving a lot of guidance and then also the roadmap. I knew that the roadmap would work if I just followed it, and it did. How did you know it would work? That's an interesting question. I think some of it was that there were other people I had talked to. I think some of it was it was intuitive that it should work because it made sense to me. Some of it is from my background in psychology, the cells that fire together, wire together, Donald Hebb's rule, that if you get it right today, it's going to be easier to get it right tomorrow. And then also from my experience, every time in the past that I would get it wrong, the next three days would suck. And day one isn't so bad, but day two is miserable. Day three is horrible. I always joked that day two is so bad, you're afraid you're going to die. And day three is so bad, you're afraid you won't die. And then all of a sudden (laughs) it starts to get easier and easier. And then you kind of forget about that. And so I knew that once I can kind of clean the slop and the withdrawal out of my system. At some point, apples start tasting sweet and you'll just get into a rhythm. And I had been in good rhythms before. It just seemed like this time it's actually possible. And I didn't think that my current success was possible. Uh, Just a few years ago, I binged 27 times during one year and I was thrilled with that tremendous success that I didn't think was possible. As compared to what you'd done before? Yeah. Which was more like 70 or 80? Probably. And during that year of 27, there were 38 days where I started down the wrong path and woke up and caught myself and came back and won the day. So I'd have a bite off plan, a lot more than a bite generally. When you do the math, that's right, 65 days, only 27 losses, right? Once every other week. And I thought, wow, if I could binge only once every other week for the rest of my life, 
I would be thrilled. And I, I remember that. I don't want to say it's ironic to look back at that because now if I binge 27 times, I plan to live to 110, by the way. And honestly, worst case scenario, can I imagine binging 27 more times in the next 63 years? I can't see that happening. I can't see it. Let's talk more specifically about that. What took you from binging once in a while to not binging at all? What took you from breaking rules once in a while to just not breaking your rules at all? So I loved the real-time refutations, the fact that I could refute things ahead of time. And, and so that was good. It, sometimes it, I'm, I'm weak at night. I'm strong in the morning. So sometimes it's three hours past my bedtime and I can't go through this process and think through everything. And I don't want to debate anyway. I've set a rule. It's an important rule and I'm going to follow it. But the fact that I've refuted this wheel already. I recognize it. I hear, oh yeah, yeah, this is your last chance to get this, blah, blah. That's old news. So part of the process of just forcing myself to write down each of the squeals. Could you go through some examples? Because a lot of people would be listening to this cold. They don't really understand what a squeal is or what a refutation is or how that can be helpful. Sure. So the basic premise that I loved was the separation of just there's me and then there's the food monster, the pig, the destructive thought process. So I've, me, the intelligent, my intellect, in my best thinking, I created my clear, bright line food rules. And any hint, any thought, any voice, anything saying that I should break those is squeal. It's coming from the bad guy. It's coming from the part of my brain that's been hijacked by the food-like substance industry that wants me to eat more, 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 and spend more, more, more on that stuff. And so its voice sounds like mine because it's telling me to break my rule. It's clearly the pig. It's clearly not me. That is the definition. And it doesn't matter if it sounds like it makes sense or not. Anything that tells me to break my rule is a thing I'm not going to debate. But doing the refutations when I'm not hungry, when I'm not facing them, but ahead of time, which was part of the program, I was able to just write down every squeal that I heard. And then as time goes on, as I hear a new one, oh, let's write that one down too. When I'm in my best mind, my best thinking, I can write down, why is this garbage? Why is this nonsense? And why am I not going to listen to it? And then later when it pops up, I'm out two hours past my bedtime. I'm actually probably hungry because I'm not normally staying up that late. Well, I've already asked and answered this thing, and I know it's nonsense. Almost all of my squeals are artificial time pressure. Uh, you got to eat this now. This is your last chance. Do this now as opposed to tomorrow morning. And so my, my response was, if this really is a good thing for me to eat, if this really is a good idea, then it'll still be a good thing for me to eat tomorrow morning. The odds that I'm actually going to starve to death between now and tomorrow morning are pretty low. I'm going to be all right. It's not actually your last chance to get this thing, right? It's not. Let's say it is. Let's say that donuts are actually going to blink out of existence tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> there, there are lots of destructive things I've never tried. I've never eaten dog poo. I've never worn my clothes backward to work. I'm still okay. It's all right. There will always be more free slop. There will always be more something that's destructive. And just because it's my last chance to do something destructive doesn't mean it's something I want to do. Perfect. Were there other refutations that were really helpful for you? There are two that jump out at me. The squeal of you can start back up again tomorrow. You can start over tomorrow. Again, it's time pressure. Oh, eat something now because don't worry about it. You'll get back up again tomorrow. My thought is one that if you make a mistake today, then it's going to make it harder tomorrow. And if you keep waiting till tomorrow, it doesn't really happen. There is no real tomorrow. It's, it's always now. But also, even if I can, and even if I will get back up tomorrow, I don't want to put myself through not being able to sleep tonight and sweating through my sheets, and then three days of slop withdrawal and misery. Even if I could, why would I want to go through that? So I wound up just saying, no, pig, why don't you try to start over again tomorrow? That usually works. 
And then this was the last one that I had difficulty with. I don't know if, I think well, about a year ago, we talked through this one, but the, I will get you eventually. So you might as well give in now. So there's, there's the linguistic aspect that works for a lot of people. The it's always now. And if I don't binge now, then you won't eventually get me because tomorrow it'll still be now. It's always today. And if I win today, it makes winning tomorrow easier and more likely. So today counts. But what I did, I kind of broke things down day by day. And there were times years past where I would just try to win the next five minutes. And there were times when I didn't win the next five minutes. And there were times when I did win the next five minutes, but only those five minutes. But when I break it down by day, I can just say, well, even if I'm going to screw up tomorrow, even if you're going to get me at some point, even if I will eventually make a mistake, so what? That doesn't mean I should do it now. My computer is going to eventually break. That doesn't mean I should break it right now. And then winning today matters. It matters for my physical health. It matters for my mental health. It gives me the confidence. So even if from now until the day I die, you know, in 63 years, I can only win one day. I'm going to choose today. Today's my day. And that strength just kind of works for me. I'm a little bit feistier than a lot of people, but it really works well for me. That makes a lot of sense. How do you know that you're not going back? It struck me you said you have absolutely zero fear that you're going to start indulging again and breaking your rules all the time. How do you know you're not going to go back to where you were? It's hard to give an objective, measurable answer. I mean, I, I have absolutely no doubt as I walk around. And anyone who's spent time with me for, for a bit of time with me for the last five years, it's just obvious to them that I walk, talk, and look different. I carry myself different. But I've lived that life and I've lived this life and I don't want that life. I wish I had known back then. It wasn't easy at all, not by any stretch. This program made it simple. It made it so you could just do it. Got to work, but you can just do it. But I know that I deserve it. I know my family deserves for me to put in whatever effort it takes, which, by the way, isn't much anymore. And my habits are so different. Being healthy is normal. Last weekend, I was flying back from Miami, and I was in the airport lounge where there's unlimited free uh, food and drinks and everything and unlimited free slop. And they had all sorts of stuff. And I, they had both raw and cooked broccoli and some other things and all sorts of drinks. And I wound up having the broccoli, some carrots, I think hummus, and a non-alcoholic beer. That's what I actually wanted. And they had all the other stuff that was sweet and, and my rules would have allowed. And it kind of didn't even occur to me that, oh, yeah, I guess I could have this, I, I suppose. I don't know. Just why would I do that? Could I under, underscore a couple of things about what you're saying? Yeah, please. First of all, I know that I got confident that I'll never go back. After I had enough wins that I recognized that where I'd come from had been sustained by the illusion of being powerless. I really thought I had no control, and I had to look away from a bunch of facts to be able to maintain that illusion. Once I saw that, even if I made a mistake, there were techniques and tools that gave me control and there were no aliens that were kidnapping me and forcing a bunch of processed food down my throat. You know, I still had to use my hands and my arms and my legs and my mouth and my tongue to put the food in there, to go drive to the store and procure it and, and put it in. That I wasn't powerless. Then I realized that I couldn't go back. When I realized that if I were powerless over food, if I were powerless over my cravings, then I wouldn't have this voice inside me that was trying to make excuses for everything. It would just go take the food. The fact that it talks at all, right? The fact that it talks at all means that it needs my permission. I have the power. Those are the big reasons why I know that I wouldn't go back. But then what you're describing is a phenomenon of really normalizing your taste buds and your dopamine responses and your, you know, kind of blood sugar up and down. And when you're not constantly flooding your body with those peaks and valleys, with the real spikes from processed food, 
you stop thinking of processed food as a treat and your pleasure systems adjust and your body systems adjust to really crave the evenness and regularity that the you know lower glycemic foods will provide. And I'm not saying, like, I'm not really, really an advocate of low carb or anything like that, but I'm, I am an advocate of getting away from as much of the junk as you can. And the less junk you have in your system, the less junk you want. And the more you really crave the experience of eating healthy food. I think that all of those things from what you're describing have really come full circle for you and given you the confidence that the problem is behind you. The big problem is behind you. Make sense? Makes sense. Whether it's the food itself or just the process of knowing that I can walk into any situation, I'm going to be fine. That confidence I enjoy. And every time I'm in some tough situation or something, which doesn't, it's, I don't really have to fight anymore, but every once in a while, I know I'm going to win. It's been more than 600 straight days of, of winning without even breaking a food rule. When I know I'm going to win, it's going to be fine. And I'm going to continue reinforcing it. I don't know if the process is just more fun or, or addicting, but it's nice to know that I'm just being healthy and doing what I'm supposed to do and in control. I wouldn't want to give that up. When you wrote me a note about today, you sent me a bunch of mantras and reflections that help keep you centered. Do you want to talk through some of these? Sure. So, and everyone who's seen me in the forums, I always have something fun to, to say. I have a few quotes. Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase by Martin Luther King. What does that mean to you? So to me, that was going through the, the process of the program, that you don't have to know exactly what success will look like. You don't have to know exactly where the destination is. But if you can just do it, do the work, do this next assignment, do this next thing, win this next round, just believe that that will work because it will. How did you have the faith that that would work? You didn't really know me before then. And how did you know that the program would work before you'd read the whole program and gone through that? Was it other people giving testimonials? Was it something in your own experience? How did you know? First of all, if marketing materials had said, you, Matt Soskins, will literally be transformed and it'll take some time and you'll do the work. If you had painted the picture of what I'm doing today, I wouldn't have believed it. I would have immediately dismissed you as um, sure just, yeah, you're, you're yeah. overselling and it's ridiculous. So, and how many times have you and I talked on the phone when I've said, hey, I'm doing great. And if I never make any more progress, that's just fine. I'm thrilled. But there's this one little thing I'm wondering. And then we've worked it through. And then I've been, wow, that's even better. So I didn't know that I would have this level of success. Didn't didn't even imagine it. My current floor is higher than my prior ceiling, but I knew that I would get better. I knew I had to try something radically different than a lot of the things I had seen. It flat out isn't true that I didn't have control. That just plainly wasn't true. I understand why a lot of people, including me in the past, want to have their ego spared by saying that it, you have a disease, it's out of your control and there's nothing you can do. But I also knew that wasn't true. And so giving me the control and rather than having me say, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? Giving me the ability to say, well, how can I? That made it obvious that I was going to make significant progress. Gotcha. Okay. Then the next mantra is? Fear exists for one purpose, to be conquered. And that's by my favorite Star Trek captain, which this is going to be very controversial, is Captain Janeway in the episode <laughs> The Thaw. There were things that I would do to avoid situations, and I don't think that's a bad idea. I think throwing yourselves to the wolves, going into one of those lounges on day one is a bad idea. Going to a big dinner party on day one is a horrible idea. But at the same time, you need to do the steps, do the progression, get some exposure and conquer the fear and do it. And so one of my rules, I went, I had a, a goal of going one year without a single bite off plan, um, did it. I even bought a t-shirt very early into that for that to celebrate that I would not wear until the end of it. And one of the rules that I didn't tell anyone 
was that if my wife wants to do something, some event, I will not say no because of fear of food. And I will just find a way, whatever that means. I couldn't, of course, tell her that because then that would have put unfair pressure on her. But I wanted to conquer that fear and it was important. And when you realize that, when you realize you can actually conquer it, you can get there, it's just such a dramatic difference. What happened in the Voyager episode, The Thaw? What was the plot ah, there? Yeah. So there was, and this is this is something I know far more about than... Um, than eating in my history, uh, is literally any Star Trek episode ever. Uh, so this is the one where the Voyager crew find a planet. There are some frozen people, you know, which are, they're not humans, but they're humans with little stuff stuck to their foreheads. And they're frozen in capsules, a, a Matrix style virtual reality. The guy who played Lenny in Lenny and Squiggy is a clown. And he was sort of created by their minds to keep them entertained, but he was fear. And they were afraid of him and he didn't want them to leave or he would kill one of them because as soon as they leave, he stops existing. And so at the end of the episode, Captain Janeway, through some trickery with the doctor, puts herself in to be a hostage uh, in a hostage exchange so they can get the people out. And that was what she tells fear is that fear exists for only you and I know that fear exists for one purpose to be conquered. And it's sort of her toughness. It's part of why she's my favorite captain. Of all of the captains, she's the smallest and the worst physical fighter and and all of that. And she's not as smart as Picard, but she was determined. And whatever it was, whatever it took, she was going to get her people home. I like that. I love that. Thank you. The next one was? Do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up. And that's Nelson Mandela. I currently am succeeding and, and I will be forever. And people see that, you know, and, and that's great. In the background, I have fallen down more than just about anybody. And sometimes I stayed down for days, weeks, months, years, all of it self inflicted, sometimes horrible. People have sometimes asked me, what's the secret to getting back up? Or how did you develop? Or were you born with the determination to get back up? I don't know if there's anything special I was born with. And, and if I was born with some special magic, I probably wouldn't have had an eating disorder, let alone for 40 years. But if you keep getting back up until you stay up, if you decide that that is who and what you are, then the pig realizes it has no chance. Matt, it seems to me from what I know about your background, you touched on a little bit here, was that you were determined to escape a genetic doom. You look at your parents and you look at the people around you and that you know, from the very beginning, you were determined to escape that. Is that accurate? It is. But that said, some of the tactics I used were not, um, they were destructive. So uh, when my dad died, he was large. It took four people to haul him out of his apartment and two people to turn him over. We had to spend extra on his cremation because of his weight. And I took his diabetes uh, medical necklaces and I would wear those to remind myself that this is me if I don't do the right thing. I would have them hanging on food in the cabinet to guard the food. Interestingly, that didn't really work, maybe in the immediate term, but it, it was one, from a mental health perspective, it was destructive. And then two, I still gained weight and was well over 200 pounds even after watching what he went through. So that wasn't the answer. And actually, one of the coaches in the program explained to me that I needed to find a way, it would be hard, but I needed to find a way to turn that into a positive. And I did. I thought about how proud he would be of me succeeding. Uh, where he couldn't and where he didn't. And so that was, I think, a great positive from it. I thought about the fact that if he had had these methods, that would be great. And then I used, don't think this is criminal, I would occasionally wear his diabetes necklace and pretend I had diabetes so that if I got caught sneaking food into a sporting event, that I would be able to say I had a medical excuse because I didn't want to eat the garbage at the at the stadium, I instead wanted to bring in actual food. But that's pretty cool. The irony of, of that and, and the way it made me feel was great. 
I love the way you turn that around or the way that your coach helped you turn that around. I find that a lot of people think they have to suffer in the way that their parents or their grandparents suffered. I went to a spiritual conference one time and the leader said, you don't honor your ancestors by suffering. You honor your ancestors by thriving. If you picture your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents and your uncles and your aunts all gathered in a stadium and you get up and you give a talk about the problem that obviously most of them have not solved, do they want you to have solved it or, and cheer for you? Or do they want to hear that, oh, this is hopeless and we're just going to keep suffering generation after generation? Your ancestors want you to thrive, by and large, for the most part. I know there are some evil people, but by and large, for the most part, they want that. And um, it sounds like you figured out how to leverage that. Good. Yeah. And, and the other members of my family are happy with my success. Others wish they could do it. And I've tried to be an inspiration and help and we're working through, but I feel that from them and it's, it's wonderful. And most importantly, you feel it from yourself. Yes. The internalization of your father being proud of you for accomplishing what he couldn't is what really matters. That's what matters for you going forward and for your kids, if you have them and you know for the people that you choose to impact. Yes. Yeah, I agree. You had a couple more mantras that you wrote down. So two are very similar. One, I'll let the jury decide who's the more inspirational leader. Things are only impossible until they are not by Captain Picard. And it is always impossible until it is done by Nelson Mandela. The idea that I'm going to go a whole year. So first I had a year where I was thrilled with 27 and then the next year I'm going to have zero. That isn't possible. That's too high of a goal. It's audacious. It's crazy. What are you doing? Don't set yourself up for failure. All those other things. Yeah, except I did it. And I remember when, when we talked a few months before that, the year, my year was going to end about, well, what are you going to do at the end of that? And, you know, what's your plan? Because there's a worry that I'm going to have a letdown. And I didn't, I didn't have a very clear answer, but I had an answer of, I don't know that I'll have the exact same intensity, but my hope is that I'll be a different person. I, I mean, we know I'm not going back. The, the question is just, could there be a little bit of a setback? But, but th there's no question about whether I'm going back to the way I was. But in truth, it actually only took two or three months before I figured out that, oh yeah, this is really going to happen. M maybe I'll make a mistake. But the idea that I'm going to completely change myself in relation to food, uh, yeah, yeah, this, this is actually really definitely happening. It's, it's already happened and it's going to happen. That took only a couple months. And all of a sudden, it just wasn't even close to impossible. In what episode did Picard say, it's always impossible until it's not? I don't remember the name of the episode, but it was when Data was trying to break through a shield on a scan. Um, Oh, I don't remember the name of the episode, but Data was saying it's impossible. And he's saying, well, things are only impossible until they are not. And he was kind of shouting when he was saying it, which is unpicard like but similar to when he shouted, shut up, Wesley, in one of the early episodes with Lore. <laughs> it's, it's not very Picard-like, but we'll let him go on a pass. Okay. Okay. In the recent series, he said one impossible thing at a time, which I really like. And they even have t-shirts that say that. As I've been taking on other tasks, other mental health tasks. Uh, I have been living by that with, you know, I, there's no way to do this except I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it one at a time. I'm going to give it time to do it, but every day I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to go through the right process. And, and I've applied these principles to lots of other areas in my life and I've helped others do that. It's made a huge difference. You said there was another inspirational leader who had the same message. <laughs> well, Nelson Mandela, you know, and, and Captain Picard. I don't know which one ripped it off from the other one. But no, that was, Nelson Mandela was talking about um, – because he did the impossible. And he set people on a, on a course of, hey, don't debate with me whether that's possible. Let's just do it first, and then, then we'll debate that later. It's kind of just quintessential, his tremendous leadership in the way that he would think about things and – let, let's do the right thing. I love learning from that example. Gotcha. Perfect. Perfect. Then I think you have one last one. You develop yourself, right? Yes. And so I bought myself uh, customized bracelets because part of the process is having your big why. 
and I reduced it to a bracelet that I would wear and, and remind myself. And I had other toys and things that I've weaned myself off of actually completely. But I had uh, this customized bracelet. And this this was my quote that I came up with, although I, I know I stole parts of this from others in the program. But I will wake up tomorrow with either pride or regret. Can I win today? That's how I feel. When I wake up tomorrow, I will look back and I will either be happy about how I handled it or I won't. You know, you could add, how can I win today? But for me, it's just the motivation of, is it possible for me to get out of this thing doing what will make me proud tomorrow? I love it. Jim Rohn said, a life of discipline is better than a life of regret. I like the way you say it better, though. It just kind of hits me in terms of, you know, because I will, I will always reflect on it. And Sometimes I go to bed and I feel a little bit hungry, or sometimes you hear the pigs say, oh, if, if you don't eat, you're, gonna, you're not going to sleep at all, which uh, one, it isn't true. I sleep so much better now, and I have actual data to prove it, and I don't snore. It's just night and day. But the idea of like, no, no, if, if I have something that makes me regretful in the morning, if I have that feeling, there, there's no way, I'm just going to walk different, talk different, feel different tomorrow. Uh, than if I do it right. I love it. Matt, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? I can't think of anything. There's, I think if anyone is hesitant, I don't know, there's this myth some people have about needing to hit rock bottom or they're waiting for something. I, I always say, you don't even hit rock bottom. You make your rock bottom when you start climbing. And today's weather is perfect for climbing. So really today's the day and get started. Say that again, you don't hit rock bottom, you make your rock bottom? What, what do you mean? Yeah, you, well, you don't hit rock bottom, you make rock bottom when you start climbing. I see. Today's weather, I mean, looking out the window, it's, it's blue sky and it's in the, here in the Pacific Northwest, it's climbing weather. I got you. That makes a lot of sense. Is there anything I can help you with? I can't think of anything. And this is, I think, the first time we've talked where I haven't said, oh, but there's this one thing because <laughs> it's rolling along. You represent the goal of what I have for my clients. I I really try to facilitate a sense of independence and reliance upon principles and, and the ability to autonomously craft their own future with food and then with life itself. So really appreciate you being willing to share all this, your vulnerability and um, perseverance and fortitude. And I hope that you will come back, you know, in six months or a year and continue to share your insights and observations. So Matt, it's been delightful. Thank you so much. This has been such a treat, enjoying getting to watch myself do something I thought was impossible. And I hope that others get the same experience and get to do it. I do want to ask you something else. What impact has this had on the people around you that know and love you? Oh, it's been amazing. It's obvious to people my level of confidence. I have led by example. So there are times... So I'm married and there were times in the past where we would do something unhealthy. Oh, you know, that dessert wasn't satisfying. I'm going to go grab a bunch of ice cream. And one person kind of has to go first. But the fact that I'm not doing it has reduced it in others. I have coached and helped some friends with these methods and applied them to other things. It's simplified things a lot. You know, you know what you're supposed to do. So when are you supposed to do it? Should you do it now or should you wait till you feel like it? And that guidance I've been able to give people leading by example and then just kind of presenting myself as the best rested, healthiest uh, version of myself has really helped a lot of people. I know I've done better at work because I've been rested and healthier. And what I do for a living makes that make a, a big difference in a lot of people's lives. But also just being able to inspire some people, being able to show people that, hey, you actually can control things that maybe you don't think you can control. You, you actually really can. That's made a difference. Well, thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of today's broadcast of Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston. If you'd like to find out more about the products and services Dr. Glenn offers to help you dramatically reduce your cravings and stop overeating in 90 days or less, please visit DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. That's DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. Thanks.